Thank you for having me speak here. And your slides are much more extensive than what I'm going to cover um, briefly, so I'm going to be focusing on the salient points. But since some of the material is outside the realm of what you do day to day as gastroenterologist, there is more backup material in your slides. So we're going to talk about evaluating and treating pain in IBD, my disclosures. And um, most medication use, psychotropic medication use is off-label, and so indicating that up front. All right, so abdominal pain is common in inflammatory bowel disease. Um, it, um, the patients who have depression and chronic pain are often the patients that are, have also the highest associated medical costs. We've been able to look at this with our extensive electronic medical records at University of Pittsburgh, and others have confirmed that 20% of patients um, make up 80% of medical costs. When um, a recently um, in-press paper, um, again from our medical records uh, at University of Pittsburgh, show that there's a strong relationship between uh, patient-reported abdominal pain, patient-reported opiate use, and the frequency by which, um, and this is a GI telephone encounter, so the frequency at which patients are calling all of you um, and um, often related to their pain, but um, for all medical causes. And so I think it's a really important area. And what I try to do in this talk is you're going to see some material repetitively, and that's going to be because hopefully coming out of this lecture, you will all feel more comfortable talking about pain, talking about pain management with your patients, and um, hopefully get a sense of what we do well as a field and where we have some work to do. So there's multiple factors involved in pain with IBD. And many of you are more expert in these specific areas um, than I as a psychiatrist. But inflammation and anatomical reasons, bacterial overgrowth, uh, neurobiological and psychological, mainly comorbid anxiety and depression, psychosocial stress, and then a growing field of genetics and specifically epigenetics where we are learning that not only can you be born with a genetic vulnerability in terms of uh, polymorphisms, but in fact stress can interact with your genes and cause epigenetic changes um, downstream. So irritable bowel syndrome or persistent pain in the presence of relatively inactive disease is pretty common, uh, 30 to 8 percent, 30 to 80 percent of adults, depending on the studies you look at, uh, up to 100 percent of pediatric patients, and of those, uh, 40 percent, up to 40 percent, having relatively low indicators of disease activity. Now, this is just to remind us when we talk about inactive IBD, um, we're not. Um, it's important we're not splitting hairs because even if we're having uh, remission in our plasma blood levels of inflammatory markers or our disease activity scales, that we can still have subtle degrees of inflammation can be picked up by um, fecal samples. And so um, there could be some small inflammation driving the pain. I think what is important to say about pain and inflammation, however, is that um, for the inflammation itself to cause pain, it really has to break through the deeper layers of the mucosa and actually affect the nerves involved. So that's why often we can have patients who have a lot of symptoms but are relatively pain-free. Now, when we're talking about visceral sensitization, so sources of pain at the level of the gut, um, again, stress can cause motility changes. Uh, stress itself can cause um, more sensitivity to visceral inputs, um, and then, but it also repetitive bowel stimulation. So even something like uh, repetitive colonoscopies in our vulnerable patients, um, acute inflammation we talked about, infection, and then neurological trauma, um, again, operations and our invasive procedures. Now enters the brain. So whatever your source of pain, the brain can amplify that. And we have a growing uh, work that's going on in actually doing neuroimaging of patients who are reporting pain, visceral pain, patients who are having uh, rectal distension. And we know that pain involves both the gut and the brain. We think about acute GI pain as more linked to 
sort of things related to disease or those mechanical factors, but chronic GI uh, pain can be um, a combination of the gut and brain, and sometimes it can be really things going on with the brain um, amplifying the signal. So when we think about uh, psychological um, contributors to the pain, depression and anxiety, both in the pediatric and the adult population, is really a foremost uh, concern and something that we see um, as high as 60 to 70 percent of our patient having some degree of these symptoms, even if not meeting the full diagnosis. The mechanisms by which they relate to pain, we really haven't worked out at a neurobiological level, but we know over and over again that they're present. Life stress, I alluded to, and um, life stress can be both ongoing life stressors, and again, a growing field is showing that early childhood trauma um, primes the system. Um, it's thought at the level of both brain processing and autonomic nervous system, sympathetic overdrive, to have a more sensitivity later in life to these pain signals. And chronic stress um, not only can have increased pain, but there's increased risk of reactivation of disease. So let's talk about what we do when we do a very thorough assessment of pain. So we really do a very uh, biopsychosocial approach. The somatic approach is probably what most of you probe most of the time. It's the usual factors that we think about in terms of probing any kind of somatic symptom. Psychologically, we look at the mood, affect, um, cognition, so catastrophizing and separate from degree of depression has been linked to increased pain perception. Coping style. We know that patients who are active copers um, actually report less pain than those that are more passive or um, more cope by emotions. And then if there's actual comorbid psychiatric illness, um, not only depression and anxiety, some of our patients have bipolar disorder and other psychiatric morbidities that again can influence pain perception. Last but not least, the social factors that are really important. Um, and um, you have them listed here. But again, what's going on in your life um, for most people, but especially our IBD patients can influence your pain perception. This is another way, and this is um, a, a diagram that I often present to my patients and thinking about the different factors. And again, you see psychosocial factors. And I want to um, stress sleep for a moment, and there's a whole separate talk on Saturday on sleep and sleep management. But sleep deprivation itself, just by itself, increases pain perceptions, the injury we talked about, the cognitions. And neurobiologically, we're learning that um, at the level of the brain with chronic pain, we can have neurodegeneration that can contribute to the pain um, and um, maladaptive plasticity. So things break down in the brain and then how they reconnect and at the level of the spinal to cord too, contribute to um, an abnormal or exaggerated um, visceral sensation. All right, so now we're gonna switch to pain management. Education. Now. I think this is an area where we, um, all of us as clinicians, underestimate the role of education, both talking and pausing with our patients about the source of pain, including brain as part of that presentation, the triggers, um, alleviating factors, so really spending time hearing from our patients what drives their pain. Family therapy is here. Now, family therapy is key not just for our pediatric patients, but for all our patients, because it is amazing how spouses and parents of our adults can enable sick role behavioral, enable sort of a um, giving in to the pain. And it's so important for us to pause and address that and really encourage um, independent coping skills in our patients. This is one of the many diagrams, again, just showing um, I have this um, as colored Xerox copies in my office that I give to patients and just um, really helps them, um, a picture speaks a thousand words, so really understand what's going on. And really emphasizing that there are neurochemical processes in the brain. This isn't an, it's all in your head or I think you're making it up. Um, and it's not an either or, that there are very real neurobiologic and now increasingly genetic reasons why you're having this pain, but the great news is that there are many things that we can do, often that you have not tried, to help that. 
So one of the things that we do, and um, I run a behavioral health clinic that's part of the GI division, both at Children's Hospital in Pittsburgh and then also at the adult division. Um, and what we call this, it's a fancy name, cognitive behavioral therapy, but basically we are working the, all the ways that the patient's thinking and the patient's behaviors, inactivity, overactivity, could be driving their exaggerated perception, so their brain's perception of this pain. Um, if they're having negative cognitions or catastrophizing, we're trying to interrupt those automatic cycles with different kinds of things that we do in session and then have the patients practice outside of session. And I think mainly if I had to put in a couple of words what CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy is, it's really teaching problem solving skills. We've shown with our pediatric, um, our adolescents, that um, when we gave them CBT compared to just their medical treatment alone in a randomized trial, that we could affect uh, depression, we could affect um, sleep in a positive way, and that we also, even with a CBT intervention that was heavily targeting depression, we could decrease their self-reported pain. Clinical hypnosis. So I'm going to pause for a moment and tell you what this is, because I think if there's one thing that is valuable to um, think about, staff members that you could send to training for this, it's in clinical hypnosis. So it's basically a trance induction. So it's an altered state of consciousness, complete with associated EEG changes, that really allows a verbal communication technique done by a trained medical professional to access automatic brain centers, brain centers that help us to modulate what we choose to pay attention to and what we choose not to pay attention to. Now, I would be surprised if there's anybody in this room that hasn't had an experience where you're in a zone and you miss an exit or you miss um, something that you're supposed to do when you're in your car, you did that because we are wired as humans to have our brains do two things at once. And again, we are taking advantage as clinicians of this state and helping um, patients to modify what they pay attention to so that the pain signal becomes secondary. I've had patients who are on heavily on narcotics, having pain for decades, come into my office, sit in my relaxation chair for 12 minutes uh, trance induction and trance work and come out of that trance from a pain of 10 to 10 all the way down to a zero or two. This does work. There's a growing empirical evidence and you've got the details in your slide, but again, I mean, we are showing changes at the brain level, the autonomic nervous system level, and the um, visceral level, including um, changes in inflammatory markers and even specifically in inflammatory bowel disease. Now these are small trials. They're done in, so far in very few locations. Um, there's a recent study um, by Kiefer and group um, showing that ulcerative colitis patients who are in remission can benefit um, from hypnosis if they have persistent pain. So um, I think you, you will see in the next five years a ballooning of the evidence that this really does work at a um, physiological level and a neurobiological level. So just to tell you what hypnosis is, so the treatments that have worked, and this is compiled both from, um, mainly from work in irritable bowel syndrome populations, and much of this done at University of North Carolina by Ole Paulson um, and his group, as well as in Manchester, England. But basically what we're doing is we're relaxing patients, we're getting them to respond, uh, relax motorically, um, move out worry thoughts from their brain, and then we're using pretty direct related um, um, suggestions when they're in this trance state to help them pay less attention and to help them normalize what's going on in their pain. One of the uh, GI targets that's very influenced by hypnosis is actually uh, motility, um, especially diarrhea. And so we really can, um, and any of you who are giving a talk, um, if you do a cycle of 10 deep breaths, you will find that your butterflies in your stomach will just fly away. All right, so this is what we use as hypnotic language. And I think um, 25 of you signed up to actually learn this in much more detail to Saturday at lunch. But your brain is now sending messages to the gut, control station, 
to tune down the intensity and quality of pain signals so that you feel less discomfort, more and more relaxed. So we use verbal and nonverbal, but um, I've, I'm always asked, what is hypnosis? That's a concrete example. Now everybody wake up and come back to me. <laughs> All right, what are the benefits of psychological treatment before we move on to the last part, which is the pharmacological interventions? So we get a high response rate. Um, you know, we can really um, make this synergistic with any kind of medical treatment. It's cost effective. Yes, you do have to hook up with a behavioral specialist either in the community or think about bringing one in. But um, we're looking at some of our new data from our center, newly generated data, showing that um, the cost of a psychologist when we're looking at the decrease in medical utilization and improvement in our patients um, really is offset in a two-year period. All right, so pain management. So this slide is just to really use as a transition. Most of these medications you all are much more expert at, so obviously the number one thing we want to do in IBD is make sure that we're treating the disease. Some of these medications, while they can help with different types of pain, have different uh, side effects, and you see them here. Um, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about opiates separately, and then most of the rest of the talk will be on the psychotropic agents. So when we use antidepressants for IBD, um, first and foremost, we're thinking about anxiety and depression. That's really the indication that most of them are labeled for in both pediatric and adult populations. But they do have direct GI effects, both in terms of affecting motility, in terms of the afferent signaling, and in terms of central pain modulatory effects. Tricyclics um, are serotonergic agents, and our mixed serotonergic noradrenergic agents are most frequently used, um, and I think most frequently used by most of you. And um, you know, we think about these agents, and especially the SSRIs and SNRIs, they're well tolerated, they have very relatively little drug-drug interactions, and few side effects. Now, the tricyclics, I think, have been the most tried and true, and they do increase serotonin to a small degree, even though they're predominantly noradrenergic agents, and they do directly impact endogenous opiate release. They can improve sleep in addition to pain. However, they have many side effects, and um, patients really prefer being on some of the additional um, alternatives. If we look here, though, at studies of antidepressant studies, and these are tricyclics, and um, you see that most of the yellow lines are um, here on the side of favoring treatment. This is just to show, in terms of side effect profiles of our tricyclics, our SSRIs and our SNRIs. So again, these are very mixed agents for tricyclics. Some these, this is where the side effects come in. Our serotonergic agents, target the 5-HT, and our SNRIs are most, more mixed. Milnasopran is a new agent, actually came out just for fibromyalgia indication, and it actually is um, the only one out there so far that um, is more like a tricyclic without the side effects, but it does have some serotonergic properties. But it's really brand new, so we really haven't seen it much in our IBD populations. So what are you thinking about when you're thinking about which drug class to use? For the tricyclics, will work for pain and depression, but as you go up in the dose, you're sacrificing a lot of side effects. They are the most cost effective. The SSRIs are the most effective if there's a high level of anxiety, and the SNRIs if it's more pain and depression, but they are most expensive. I think the biggest thing you can do is to address false expectations of patients, provide the explanations we've been talking about in terms of the psychopathology behind their symptoms, and really make sure that they have a very realistic um, knowledge that for pain, it could take up to four to six weeks to benefit. The side effects, if they have the side effects, do tend to decrease spontaneously by staying on the same dose. It can take one to two weeks. And um, as always, with all medications, thinking about what's worked or not worked for them and a family history is still our best predictor of response in, um, for these medications. Um, 
pentin pregabalin is used. Now, historically, it's been used much more for neuropathic pain. Its mechanism really is not understood. Recently, there are some interesting studies um, in fibromyalgia showing that it actually does change uh, metabolism in the brain. So I think we still need to understand if this may have an effect. The important thing to know about this class of medication is it takes three to four months to see an effect, um, not weeks. So here are some other agents. We don't have time to cover them in detail, but I think, again, we use many of our psychotropic medications directly for GI indications, including pain, but you see some of the other uh, indications here, and you have these in your slides. Quetiapan is worth mentioning. Um, at high doses, it's an atypical antipsychotic used in bipolar disorder, even schizophrenia. In tiny doses, though, there is a study showing that it was effective in um, improving some improvement in um, GI symptoms about abdominal pain, and it actually helps patients sleep. Um, what is important, though, is that um, even in this trial showing these positive effects, 50% 50 50 of the patients came off the medication because they didn't like the side effects. So even at low doses, it can cause metabolic syndrome, can cause um, other problems. So we do use this in a way um, only as a last resort. So again, here um, is just to summarize that when you're using these psychotropic agents, you're not just affecting the brain, but we are changing things in the peripheral level. And this also includes narcotics. So um, really, I think that the important message when you review all the literature on narcotics for abdominal pain is that we really used chronically, that is. Um, there really is not much evidence for their having a positive effect. However, the um, side effects and the um, potential um, complication um, list is growing. So there are risk factors for narcotic use becoming chronic, psychiatric comorbidity, a uh, history of abuse are um, above, up, up, uh, on the top of the list, um, including substance abuse. And when we think about um, opiates, we're thinking not just about the psychological and physical dependence, um, there's higher rates of infection, mortality, and also um, narcotic bowel syndrome. Um, narcotic bowel syndrome is something that we're just starting to learn about. A few groups, case series, have reported on it. And basically it means that patients are having persistent or actually increasing pain, yet their level of narcotics um, and dosing is increasing. And what's important here is that um, the, it's thought that um, after a while, the narcotics themselves are causing inflammation at the level of, of the spinal cord, maybe even the brain, that it's then contributing to the ongoing um, pain. There's a growing list of problems with long-term use of opiate therapy. And addiction, diversion are sort of the commonly um, thought of, but abnormal immune function, obviously the constipation. Um, in males, altered um, reproductive system, so a testosterone deficiency can be induced with chronic use. And I think the important thing here is that there, is, there are safe and effective ways to get patients off narcotics. The key is motivating them, having a good doctor-patient relationship. But um, our colleagues at UNC and others are testing detox protocols where you're building a relationship with the patient and then um, come bringing them in for brief hospitalization where they're put on an IV morphine equivalent and then tapered um, in a way where they're also getting um, drugs for withdrawal. And so in three to four days, very effectively coming off the narcotics. In the patients that um, go through this detox, um, here we're looking at um, the pre-detox um, scores of their pain. And so we can see that of the patients who tolerate the detox, which is about 89% in this sample, a very small sample of 39, um, they were successful, and um, approximately 45% uh, were able to stay off these narcotics at three-month follow-up. 
it's doable, but we still have a lot of work to do to keep people off of these medications. This is just showing, again, the success of detox and responders is at least a 30% reduction in pain. So we are having, again, the majority of patients showing a response, and we have to identify, again, what we can do to help keep these patients off. There's other things besides medications that we can use. Um, these are some of the complementary approaches, and the, really the one that I focused on is acupuncture. So it's out there, there's hypothesized mechanisms. There hasn't been a single successful randomized trial showing that this is effective, and I think that's really important in terms of thinking about recommending to our patients. So in summary, um, IBD is associated with many different types of pain. I think we always want to start with maximizing the medical treatment, but then there are ways, and especially using behavioral paradigms first, that we can really significantly impact pain, and about 70% of our patients will respond with a behavioral intervention and some form of non-opiate medication. And then um, sort of um, you know, opiates really being used as a last and, and hopefully someday as not a resort for chronic pain, um, even chronic pain for other reasons. Um, there are different um, organizations that are putting a lot of educational effort into um, trying to help with developing protocols and educating all of us how to do this better. There's all sorts of augmentation strategies, and I think what's important is that each of you are thinking about what you're doing um, and how you do it and to um, apply these non-opiate medications in a systematic way. And again, um, really thinking um, in a sort of uh, algorithm um, hierarchical way, starting with the doctor-patient relationship, and then each of you has to have your own threshold of when you want or can include a behavioral specialist to be part of this regime. Thank you.